This one is
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Litvak. I direct the Division of International Security Studies at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, and on behalf of uh, the traveling Howard Wolpe, I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, session, which will focus on recent developments. Take two. Do I have the green lights on? Is this microphone not? No? Okay. Um, today's session will focus on recent developments in Somalia. And we're fortunate to have with us today two distinguished specialists, uh, Matt Bryden and An Andre uh, Lesage. Um, uh, today's session will focus on recent events in Somalia. The division of labor will be that Matt uh, Bryden will focus primarily on developments on the ground, uh, and Andre Lesage uh, will focus uh, primarily on U.S. policy and options. Uh, for those of you not familiar with them, um, Matt Bryden directs the International Crisis Group's Horn of Africa project. He's lived and worked in the region for 15 years, working with Médecins Sans Frontières, United Nations and WSP. <clears throat> At ICG, he oversees the preparation of analytical reports on the sources of conflict and violence in the region, with a particular focus on Sudan and Somalia. Uh, Andre Lesage is Assistant Professor and Academic Chair for Terrorism and Counterterrorism at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, the Africa Center is, is a U.S. Department of Defense regional center and is affiliated with the National Defense uh, university. Uh, he's also worked uh, extensively in the region. Um, he was a political advisor to the Somalia National Reconciliation Conference. He's worked with other peace processes and negotiation efforts in Darfur and uh, Southeast Asia. He's published widely uh, in the field. Uh, our speakers will each uh, lead off for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for comments and questions. So, Matt, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, again, um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to a subject that is um, very close to my heart and uh, apparently uh, uh, to, to many of you as well. Um, what I'm going to try and do is, is really just summarize uh, events uh, on the ground in Somalia over, over recent months. There has been a lot of movement. and. Um, I, I guess I would start by saying that it's good to have, um, for the first time in a long time, um, reasons for, for some optimism. Uh, guarded optimism, cautious optimism, people will qualify it different ways. Um, but to be able to report that some things seem to be moving in, in, in positive directions. Um, of course, there's still room for a lot of things to go wrong. Um, but I'll come to this. Um, uh, step by step uh, through the presentation. The, the topic uh, we've chosen uh, for today's discussion, Somalia's quest for peace and, and, and security in the recent developments, in some way that's a, that's a misnomer. Somalia has known, most of Somalia has known, um, a relative level of peace and security uh, in recent years. Uh, civil war, large-scale violence, um, with the exception of eruptions here and there, sporadic uh, outbreaks of fighting, uh, really ended many years ago. And so it's quite possible to, to travel throughout much of Somalia without uh, fear of fighting. Uh, there is insecurity, there's banditry, as there is in many places uh, where either the state is weak or, or non-existent. But uh, civil war, per se, really is a thing of the past. The quest, the challenge for Somalia, um, really has been the pursuit of government or governance, reconstituting the central institutions of the state without giving rise to renewed violence, new tensions, new divisions. <coughs> the transitional federal institutions established in October 2004 uh, were just the latest in a series of, um, of attempts to established government in Somalia, and, and uh, they're not the first. Uh, hopefully, for those people seeking peace and government, they will be the last. Um, but Somalia has seen a, a vicious cycle of failure uh, over the years, repeated attempts to establish a government that have uh, collapsed or petered out, only to be repeated again. And there are a number of, of threads that run through this, uh, this succession of, of uh, disappointments. And that is that it's uh, 
typically peace initiatives have been uh, internationally sponsored, often taking place on foreign soil. Um, and each time that people come together and, and discuss, initially the dynamics are positive. There are anyone who's attended a, a reconciliation conference is familiar with demonstrations of nationalism and fraternity, uh, people promising to set aside their differences. Um, but inevitably, once the institutions are declared or formed, um, the differences begin to come to the surface. And we could list uh, the, the succession of governments declared since 1991, Ali Mahdi's administration in Mogadishu immediately after the, uh, uh, the fall of the Barre regime, uh, the attempts to set up a, a, a transitional national council in Addis Ababa, 1993, uh, the attempt to set up a government, uh, under what was known as the Sodere process in Ethiopia, 96, Cairo, 97, uh, Djibouti, 2000, and uh, Mbagathi, Eldoret, uh, 2002 to 4. Um, almost without exception, and I sort of have to necessarily generalize, at some point the new government or new authorities that have been declared, whether or not they become real or declared, they become associated with either a political clique or a, um, identified as representing certain factional or clan interests. Uh, an opposition emerges, often opportunistic, um, which typically over, it, it exaggerates the political or clan nature of the leadership. Uh, polarization begins. Uh, the government, um, rather than engaging the opposition, will typically say they are spoilers and terrorists and, and so on. The opposition may make like uh, similar accusations. So the spiral begins, it un uh, it, uh, the process begins to unravel. Leaders travel the world, usually from both sides, government and opposition. They go to conferences, they seek foreign money, they get a level of recognition from some governments, <coughs> not many. Um, and. Uh, and so the, the cycle tends to repeat itself every few years um, until uh, 2004. Um, and now uh, uh, we're in that same process today. Um, when the transitional federal institutions were formed in October 2004, this was the result of a two-year process that saw many of the same dynamics. It was an attempt to heal the divisions that had emerged following the establishment of the transitional national government in Djibouti in 2000. That government, in a sense, um, had been set up not necessarily uh, destined to failure, but certainly destined for difficulty. The process in Djibouti had established a government, a central government, that did not include um, the leadership of several of the de facto administrations on the ground throughout Somalia. Um, and almost by default, it attracted the opposition from those de facto administrations, uh, rallied them around central institutions based in Mogadishu, and so set up a dynamic of, of tension between this newly declared central authority and many of the, uh, what were then known as the building blocks on the ground throughout Somalia. So rather than being able to get down to work and exercise some de facto authority, the TNG was immediately caught in this dynamic of confrontation uh, with um, authorities on the ground and an alliance that was established and backed by Ethiopia known as the Somalia Restoration and Reconciliation Council, or SRRC. Um, and partly through um, the errors, the shortcomings of its own leadership, and partly through the, these concerted opposition uh, effort, the TNG never really uh, took off. But the political alliances that underpinned it remained active um, even beyond the expiration of its mandate in 2003. And in 2004, under the auspices of IGAD um, in Kenya, uh, the uh, Somali National Reconciliation Count, uh, Conference was, was launched. And although this is, a, again, a sort of gross oversimplification, the attempt was to unify these two main threads of uh, uh, or political tendencies in Somalia, the SRRC on the one hand and those forces that had supported the TNG on the other. Um, it was a long and difficult process, two years of, uh, of, of constant uh, negotiation. 
but it emerged with what appeared to be, with many shortcomings, uh, a government of national unity. And it was to the, um, I think, surprise and dismay of many observers and participants that shortly after the government was formed, um, that it divided into two camps, uh, one based in Johar, led by the President and Prime Minister, the other based in uh, Mogadishu. Um, some would say led by the Speaker of Parliament. Uh, more realistically, it was a sort of uneasy coalition of interests, various faction leaders in Mogadishu, um, the Speaker of Parliament, um, and, uh, and assorted other forces within particularly the capital city and some outside it. The divisions in the government appeared to be, for those of you who followed, they appeared to be over issues. Uh, most divisive were the appeal for foreign troops to come to Somalia, the associated request that the arms embargo be lifted to allow troops to deploy and for the government to arm and, and equip its security forces, and the third issue being the relocation of the executive wing of the government um, to Johar, 90 kilometers north of the capital, rather than to Mogadishu itself, on the grounds that the capital was insecure. These were very serious issues, and there, were, there are pros and cons on both sides. But equally contentious, and I would submit possibly even more contentious, was in fact the way these decisions were taken. Um, the decision to move the government to Johar, per se, uh, didn't find a legitimization within the charter itself. Um, the charter itself specified Mogadishu as the capital. Now, that may or may not in itself have been problematic, but to the extent that the previous charter, the transitional national government, had specifically permitted a temporary seat of government on the grounds that the capital was insecure, um, it was strange that this omission, uh, the, the TFG's charter, omitted to mention this. In two years of negotiations, this, is, this item was not put on the table and so wasn't negotiated. So the fact that it was then put forward almost as soon as the government was formed uh, was seen as some in the Mogadishu camp as an attempt to um, hijack the transition and introduce a new element which hadn't been discussed. Uh, the appeal for foreign troops as well had not in two years of negotiations been put forward, uh, nor of course the arms embargo, the request for lifting of the arms embargo. And so um, there, were, there was opposition to these demands, some of it cynical and opportunistic, but some of it finding uh, legal justification within the Charter itself. The Parliament was unable to conclusively uh, uh, decide one way or the other. Uh, the one session at which this, these items were tabled in, in Nairobi in March last year degenerated into a brawl, uh, while one camp said that the, uh, the deployment of forces um, had been accepted, but with the exclusion of troops from frontline states, Ethiopia, Djibouti, and Kenya. The others said that the session was invalid because it degenerated into a brawl. Uh, there was a subsequent session convened by a deputy speaker, even though the speaker was present. One camp said that this legitimized deployment. The other said there was no quorum and it was anyway illegal. And so we remained basically de facto with two, two uh, deeply opposed wings, physically separated, politically divided. Um, whatever the merits of their discussions, uh, in January this year when the Speaker and the President agreed that um, Parliament should meet, they agreed at Aden, what has become known as the Aden Agreement, that Parliament should meet, it was a recognition on the part of both sides that reconvening of a full Parliament, an attempt to, to revive debate within the Parliament was the way forward. And while initially it was very tentative whether the Aden Agreement would be realized, um, the dynamics, the momentum and support of the, the Parliament reconvening accelerated rapidly to the point that we now have had the, the Parliament uh, officially opened uh, on the, the 26th and uh, then uh, breaking for a short recess and supposed to reconvene this week. The challenge um, now facing the Parliament, if, if 
this session is to in fact unlock um, this impasse and to prescribe a way forward for the transitional national institutions. Um, there's no simple solution here, but I think three main things have got to take place over the coming weeks and possibly months as Parliament meets. The first is that at one point during this session, there will have to be a, an agreement on a genuine government of national unity. What we have seen so far is two factions competing within or under the umbrella of the same government, but not in fact joining together behind a common program. The Johar wing, essentially based on a core of, of what used to be the SRRC, the Mogadishu group in some respects, uh, the old TNG, um, competing within the government but not united behind a common program. This will probably require some reshuffling of the cabinet. It will uh, almost certainly require a trimming of the cabinet. Roughly one-third of the parliament have posts as ministers or deputy ministers or assistant ministers. Um, and one of the problems is that with so many cabinet appointments, there are ambiguities as to who really has power. There are three or four ministers who share responsibility for national security. This has bred rivalries, this has bred uh, uh, ambiguities as to who's really in charge that have fueled the division within the, the uh, government. The same in terms of reconstruction, reconciliation, and so on. So the fusing of the two wings, uh, a genuine merger, um, is one of the, the challenges facing Parliament. A second is to return to the Charter itself. Um, and here I mean not legally, legalistically speaking all of the articles and, and uh, points contained within the Charter, uh, but to the fundamental principles of the Charter upon which it's based. The Charter is a deeply flawed document. Um, it's natural. It is a, it's an awkward hybrid that was negotiated over a long period of time. There are ambiguities. There is confusion over, for example, whether or not ministers have to be members of parliament or not, and differing interpretations because of different, uh, uh, partly based on different <coughs> versions. But there are a number of things that the parliament is absolutely crystal clear about. The first is that uh, the supremacy, that, that the rule of law is supreme. And the only law, in effect, is the charter, and on the basis of the charter, uh, elements of the previous constitution that um, uh, deal with those aspects of, of, uh, that the Charter itself does not address. Second is that the Charter should be interpreted in the spirit of national unity, reconciliation, and democratic values. Um, it is hard to accept that some of the decisions that have been taken essentially unilaterally uh, by the leadership of, of the TFG TFIs on both sides without being submitted to a forum in which they are debated and discussed and in which at least a, a majority or preferably a sufficient uh, consensus within the parliament is achieved. It's difficult to consider these to have been taken in a spirit of national unity, reconciliation or, or democracy. Uh, the proroguing of parliament, um, this brings me to the third point, the third point in the chart on which it's very clear is that uh, no individual may arrogate to himself or herself powers that are not specifically provided for in the Charter or in legislation based on the Charter. Um, and this means that certain decisions which are not covered by the Charter, either because it's silent or it says something else, like the location of the capital, like the deployment of foreign troops and the arms embargo, um, quite possibly uh, involve powers that are not uh, assigned within the Charter to, to any branch of government. The only way in which to resolve the disputes over these issues is to bring them before Parliament, have a debate, and ensure that there is some kind of consensus within the TFIs before these decisions are taken. Possibly, in some cases, legislation is required to allow some of these decisions or to legitimize and legalize some of these decisions. So particularly on these kinds of fundamental principles, uh, the Charter is clear, and in the discussions and debates over the coming weeks, 
uh, one of the challenges for the Parliament is to respect this, uh, uh, the intent of the Charter, if not uh, always its letter. Where the letter of the Charter is important and is essential is that the Charter gives to the transitional federal institutions uh, a road map, the essential elements of a transitional program, what needs to be achieved. Uh, this is spelled out essentially in the establishment of a number of commissions with responsibility for various aspects of the transition, security, constitution, federal affairs, reconciliation, land and property disputes. There are very few aspects of the transition that are not covered or touched on in the Charter itself. Um, already, however, we've seen a number of programs <coughs> Uh, and projects of the TFIs that have been launched without having any of these fundamental bodies in place. Constitution, the, the commissions have not been established. Uh, some individuals have been named in some cases. The Charter requires that the commissions uh, and their terms of reference be approved by Parliament. Since Parliament was essentially dissolved uh, a year ago, uh, Parliament has not been able to meet, consider, approve legitimize these commissions. That means a lot of activities that would normally have parliamentary oversight have been proceeding independently. Uh, there are proposals as to local level reconciliation throughout Somalia uh, that have been put forward by the government. Uh, there has been considerable discussion of a national security plan uh, bringing together various militia forces, uh, setting up of national security institutions, but again the, the charters provisions for parliamentary oversight of these activities, ensuring that they are politically acceptable, that you have buy-in from all of the major forces, particularly the major military forces, are not covered uh, or haven't been established um, so far. Um, one of the first orders of business would be then for Parliament to, having established its own committees and subcommittees, many of most of which have not been established yet, to, uh, to form uh, these commissions, to give them terms of reference, and then to bring in ongoing projects and programs of the government under this kind of parliamentary oversight. In the interest of time, I'll skip some of the other sort of elements of the transitional program. Uh, let me just sum up that section by saying that um, while there are many other things that the government has embarked upon, there is a question of priority here. The priority needs to be what is in the Charter. Everything else, if it can be achieved, if more can be achieved, is, is well and good. Um, but it should not be achieved at the expense of fulfilling what has been agreed by the parties to the Mbagathi Peace Accords, the Charter itself. There are two other um, major issues recent developments that are worthy of note. And uh, again, I'll touch on them now and probably in question and answer uh, we could examine them further. One is that while we see the parliamentary session in Baidoa moving in the right direction, we have seen um, very serious fighting in the city of Mogadishu uh, in the last couple of weeks. And this naturally raises concerns that um, the, the Baidoa session could be derailed, could be undermined. Um, definitely this kind of violence is bad news. Um, it may be premature to try and assess what its impact has been. Um, but I think there, on the positive side, none of the parties that have been involved in the fighting over the last couple of weeks has taken a position of rejecting either the transitional federal institutions or the peace process, um, and neither seems to have, as a, at least as an explicit agenda, the disrupting of the Baidoa session. On the contrary, uh, parties to the fighting have actually facilitated the travel of, of members of parliament to Baidoa, um, and there have been some expressions of support for the Baidoa session itself. There's no question that some of the key uh, parties are tied down in this fighting, and that we may yet see things take a more negative turn. Uh, but there is still reason to hope that uh, the fighting itself um, involves more localized issues and that uh, in terms of the process of reconciliation, 
Um, it is not intended to derail or disrupt it, maybe to assert a little leverage, but uh, so far not more than that. The, the third development, um, and somewhat independently of this, is that we have uh, the request of the Somaliland administration for membership in the African Union. And the African Union now actively considering how to, to respond to that request. Um, the issue of timing um, for this request and the emphasis, the spotlight that it throws on the question of Somali unity is, um, is problematic in the sense that right now the most diplomatic and political efforts are focused on uh, developments in Baidu and Mogadishu. Um, but since um, the AU has not cho chosen the timing, um, it's worth having a look at what the likely developments are going to be on the AU side. The, um, the AU sent a fact-finding mission to Somaliland last year and reported back relatively favorably on the situation there. And in terms of legal discussions inside the AU, seems to have reached an internal um, understanding that the case is not, there are not major legal obstacles to Somaliland's request. The AU itself has considered cases of self-determination in the past and is prepared to consider future cases of self-determination. What uh, it does not do is suggest one way or the other as to how that case of self-determination may be resolved, positively or negatively. Um, the likelihood in terms of where the AU is, um, how the, the AU may respond to this, um, is to consider this an issue of peace and security in the Horn of Africa. That uh, the question of Somali unity, whichever way it's resolved, is a critical issue that raises concerns about stability and security in both, on both sides of the dispute. <coughs> and so for the AU finally to pay attention, to become engaged, um, and to seize itself of the matter, um, seize the, the regional body taking a role that it so far has not taken and that um, uh, the, the UN itself has basically left to the AU to, uh, to take under consideration. And so the involvement of this, uh, the raising of this issue in a way that is likely to involve um, a fairly lengthy process of dialogue consultation and discussion, um, it can be hoped at least, is going to take off some of the heat and um, let's say to mitigate or to minimize the likelihood that misunderstandings and tensions on this issue could lead to the outbreak of violence. So as I'm reminded that I'm coming to, to, to the end of my time, let me just say there's a lot of moving parts. I've only mentioned three. Uh, within them are very complex dynamics. There are still a lot of things that could go wrong. Somalia has uh, an unfortunate habit of uh, surprising and disappointing us at moments of hope. Um, but for the first time in a long time, we really do see progress towards uh, what may be uh, stability, security, and the restoration of uh, governance throughout uh, Somali territory, some positive trends. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much. Andre, over to you. Okay. This one. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Crisis Group and to the Wilson Center for asking me to, to join you here today. I'm going to try and complement the remarks that Matt made um, by focusing on the challenges that this situation that's developing in Somalia presents for um, the U.S. government and policymakers from other parts of the international community. I want to be clear up front that I'm not speaking for or advocating for um, the government. These are my, my personal uh, opinions as an academic. Um, I do believe that if we take a snapshot of what's happening in Somalia today, that the situation looks, looks pretty grim, actually. Um, we've got some significant fighting in Mogadishu over the past week um, with dozens of people that have been killed and hundreds wounded. Um, that's going on in a context of, of drought and humanitarian crisis. 
which has uh, been a regular occurrence in the country for well over a decade now. Um, over a year into the transitional federal government's uh, transitional period, we have very little progress. We're only seeing the second meeting of the, of the parliament, and many key figures are not even at that meeting. As well, you've got the increasing role played by Islamic militants, particularly in Mogadishu, but with networks that span um, the country and go well into very stable areas such as Puntland and Somaliland. At the same time, that snapshot should not detract from the very <laughs> positive trends that also exist. And particularly on the, on the political level, the faction leaders who are involved in the TFG, although their relationships may be very acrimonious, none of those faction leaders have ever left the government or defected from it. And this is a substantial difference between the current situation and what happened with the transitional national government and the SRC faction after the Arta peace process. Um, as Matt was saying, with the signing of the Aden Declaration, I think some of the major political leaders, including President Abdullah Yusuf, um, the Speaker of the Parliament, many of the faction leaders in Mogadishu, are recognizing that their hopes for the future lie in making that agreement work, lie in making the transitional institutions function, that they are not certain they will be able to survive um, a return to conflict um, and a return to another cycle of violence. They might not be the political leaders who are left standing at the end of another cycle of violence. We still have um, remarkable international consensus and a relatively positive regional environment um, in which the, the peace process can move forward. We do not have substantial disagreement between any of the, the Western or other uh, foreign diplomats and <coughs> relations between regional powers such as Ethiopia, Kenya, and Djibouti, although never entirely harmonious, are not as rocky as they have been in the past. This is not to paint an over-optimistic picture, um, but it is to say that with the Baidoa meeting, that it will be conceivable that a functioning TFG, even if a minimalist government, could come out. Um, that's going to depend significantly on the ability of political leaders to achieve a power sharing agreement, to bring all of the faction leaders into uh, a single plan of action, and to follow through on what the transitional uh, charter has said is the, the roadmap or the plan of action um, for issues that need to be addressed to bring us towards elections and the selection of a new permanent government. I think the next few weeks um, are a really critical time for Somalia. Certainly what happens in Mogadishu and the cycle of violence there is going to be critical to see what comes, but equally important what's happening in Baidoa, whether the meeting of the parliament will succeed or not. If we do have another failure of the TFG, I think we can predict based on past peace processes um, what will come. Internal conflicts um, are going to break out um, across the country. We will see another cycle of violence, certainly in Baidoa with the Rahanwain Resistance Army, factions internal to the RRA contesting who controls uh, Baidoa. Likely problems will continue to grow in Kismayo, in Puntland, in Ghetto, as members of the TFG would return to their home areas and, and contest control of theirs, those areas. In Mogadishu, we would probably see the emergence of new uh, splinter groups, young faction leaders who try to take control from the older faction leaders. Uh, second, you can expect as these internal power struggles develop that you would get alliances form. Alliances similar to the TNG-SRC confrontation that appeal for foreign military and foreign financial support and suck us into a dynamic not just of internal Somali confrontation but of a confronta confrontation that affects the entire region. What would that change? Um, in some ways we'd be looking at much more of the same. Continuing humanitarian crisis, intermittent battles, some towns might change hands in terms of control but the front lines would again eventually stabilize, the warlords would um, run out of resources to continue their fight, and maybe we could start thinking of another peace process uh, sometime in about five years. 
That's not to say, however, that the, the cycle can continue ad nauseum. There are always uh, big differences between one peace process and the next, and Somali political dynamics do evolve. Um, if you think back to the earliest peace processes, there was a real focus on trying to re-stimulate clan <coughs> and clan elders' control over the militia factions, uh, trying to get them involved in, in cutting a deal. That gave way in uh, the mid-90s to peace processes that focused almost exclusively on the warlords to the exclusion of any form of civil society. Moved on again with the ARTA process and the significant involvement of Somali businessmen businessmen who had benefited a great deal uh, from the war economy and were trying to exercise their interests. And I think if we have a failure of this current process, we'll be looking at a very different Somali future as well. In this case, we have really seen the rise and activism of political Islamic groups um, in Somali politics um, and they're exercising a very significant influence. Leaving traditional practice of Islam in Somalia aside, we still have a very, very complicated array of Islamist groups uh, in the country. There are um, the militant jihadi groups that we often associate with Al-Qaeda or Al-Itihad al-Islam. There are non-violent uh, fundamentalist groups such as Tablik, which have uh, incredible uh, presence in the country now. Reformist, modernist groups such as Al-Islam. Um, and even politically engaged Sufist groups such as Al Sunnah Wal Jamaah. Um, however, of, of all of these, if we take stock right now, it is certainly the, the militant and the, the nonviolent fundamentalist groups that um, are seeing their power and influence increasing and growing very strongly. Many of the moderate, modern, modernist, and reformist movements are really being eclipsed, uh, if not marginalized, in this process. Um, it's interesting to see how little control is being exercised on the Islamist movements by traditional Somali clan structures, um, which remain very important across the country, but do not seem to be able to get to grips with the Islamic factor. Um, there have been, over the last two years, uh, a series of assassinations um, in Mogadishu, a series of attacks on Somalis as well as on foreigners across the country, all of which have been tied back to a very small network of Islamic militants. And there really has not been a response by the clans that those militants hail from, nor the ability of other clans to exact the revenge um, or receive the dia payments for, for the attacks that have taken place. The traditional Somali uh, justice system of Her is, is really showing its weakness in confronting uh, this dynamic. The seriousness of the threat from Islamic militants I don't think can be underestimated or should be underestimated. Um, certainly the faction leaders and the warlords in Somalia are not underestimating it. Um, currently with the fighting in Mogadishu, you see some very odd um, old enemies, uh, bitter rivals coming together in an alliance against some of the Islamists, particularly targeting foreign Islamic um, militant elements that are in Mogadishu. When you get people like Muhammad Dere and Musa Sudi joining the same alliance together, it shows that they have some common interests and there's some real common concerns about the future of Somalia that override their parochial disputes. Um, I said I was going to talk about the uh, challenges this raises for the U.S. and other policymakers. Let me just try and capture, if I can, what I think <coughs> the current U.S. approach uh, to the situation in Somalia is. I think there are two um, elements of a diplomatic approach that have emerged and been officially endorsed. One is that the U.S. wants to see the transitional federal government succeed, but is not investing its uh, influence to back one set of faction leaders or another set of faction leaders to emerge as the, the power brokers in the TFG. Rather, the focus is on the transitional federal institutions, the transitional charter, and seeing that that moves forward according to the parameters that the Somalis have set for themselves through the Mbagathi peace process. And I think the second objective that's been laid out for U.S. policy is that 
counterterrorism is a major priority, but that effective long-term counterterrorism success depends on the existence of, of a functioning government. That uh, counterterrorism will not succeed uh, in a ungoverned area, um, in an area that is simply um, governed by, by warlords and uh, foreign cooperation with those warlords. While those are very good diplomatic objectives, unfortunately we do not see the investment in um, the diplomatic presence, certainly not in Somalia because of the security situation, but even in the neighboring countries. Um, it is really up to a very small group of people led by one individual um, in the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi who is responsible for implementing the, the diplomatic side of the U.S. strategy out there. In addition to the diplomatic component, you have uh, ongoing development effort led by USAID. Um, first and foremost, they have been very successful in responding to food shortages, health crises such as cholera outbreaks. And secondly, I think we could look at the success of general uh, humanitarian and development interventions in promoting a very active um, and liberal civil society within Somalia. That said, the track record after 15 years of development activities is not very uh, positive one. We have these recurrent cycles of drought that because of the pauperization caused by the conflict have really led um, to a, a level of structural vulnerability that humanitarian and development assistance is, is not ameliorating. Um, in addition, the active liberal civil society has shown itself patently incapable of confronting um, extremists and terrorist groups that are in their midst. Um, they do not have the, the political or, uh, or military, certainly, wherewithal to, uh, to engage in, um, in that dispute. In addition, um, third component of U.S. engagement is, is a military component. Um, the Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa has been in existence for some time now, but I think it's very important to, to note, and this doesn't always come across so clearly in some of the press coverage of CJTF HOA, but CJTF HOA is not <coughs> operational in Somalia. CJTF HOA, based in, uh, based in Djibouti, is mostly mounting a, a containment operation. Um, by training partner countries' militaries, um, particularly Ethiopia, Djibouti, and Kenya, by conducting humanitarian operations, they are very active in the border areas that surround Somalia, but are not actively penetrating um, any part of Somali territory. Um, this means that their influence and their focus is really on preventing any threat of ideological extremism or militant activity that's ongoing inside Somalia from bleeding out across the country's borders into, into other areas, preventing um, the kind of weapons shipments and uh, migration of terrorist operatives that led to the 2002 attacks uh, in Mombasa, for instance. Um, we've also seen, uh, in response to the incidence of piracy um, over the past couple of months, a, a great interest in maritime security and how that can be improved. Um, we don't just have a Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa based in Djibouti. There is also Combined Task Force 150, which is an international um, naval effort to secure the Indian Ocean. I would assume that there will be increased cooperation between the naval and land forces component in response to the piracy incidents. Um, but that is certainly not to say that the piracy incidents are in any way related to the terrorist threat uh, in the short run. And fourth, there is certainly, I don't think we can deny this, other security activity, intelligence activity ongoing in Somalia. Um, I feel very comfortable in saying this directly because even though it is not something that's mentioned in newspapers, it is certainly something that is actively discussed all across Mogadishu. Um, this is not covert for the Somalis who have a very strong reputation for, uh, for actively discussing aspects of political intrigue. Um, the common uh, wisdom about intelligence activity is that it is primarily focused on identifying and capturing foreign jihadists, people with al-Qaeda connections that are based in Mogadishu or other parts of the country. Um, also that that level of activity is now being guided by 
um, direct relations with cooperative Somali allies. It is not something that heavily depends, as it did immediately after September 11th, on um, intelligence that is passed from neighboring countries, which might not be as accurate. However, even the very direct engagement of intelligence services in Somalia, I think we need to question the success that they have been having, certainly over the past six months or so, where the rivalries within the TFG, the parochial politics that have emerged between the faction leaders, have really seized their interest and attention to such an extent that it is very difficult for them to cooperate at the same time and show an interest in cooperating with the United States or any other country on counterterrorism efforts. So I really do think we need to stand back and ask to what extent the existing U.S. strategy based on diplomatic engagement, development activities, a military containment, and then a covert intelligence approach is really working. The humanitarian crises continue. The TFG as the long-term peace-building solution has really not moved forward in, uh, in a good amount of time since it was created in October 2004. And yes, there are some signs of hope, but it really appears <coughs> that those hopes are being left up to the Somali actors themselves, particularly warlords who do not have a very good track record. And at the same time, the threat posed by uh, militant Islamist movements is really on the move. So the challenges that I see for, for U.S. policymakers and other policymakers is, one, how to get the TFG to work. And I, I think it's very important here in, in considering peace building that we need to understand the very local political and economic concerns about which Somalis um, will be negotiating themselves. If the government is going to work, it's not going to be because they all come together and just decide they want peace. There are vested interests, vested political interests and economic interests that Somali warlords, Somali businessmen and others have. The problem that we are seeing with the TFG right now is different than in the past. We're not just talking about spoilers. There are people who think, okay, these people just do not want peace because maybe they'll be brought to justice, maybe they'll lose, um, lose all, of their, all of their power. People like General Morgan or the former TNG president, Abdikasim. Um, those are the kind of people that come to mind. But the real arguments that are polarizing uh, the current situation with the TFG um, are, are very parochial concerns between people who want to be engaged. People like President Abdullah Yusuf, uh, people like Mohammed Kanyare. Um, they are interested in sharing power and they need, I believe, assistance in helping them realize that vision. Uh, this is not just about the big issue questions about whether there will be a lifting of the arms embargo or whether there will be um, foreign military troops, Ethiopian troops, people talk about a lot deployed into the country. This is about protecting the interests of business and power relative to one another that they will have in the future in the government. Um, I realize I'm at the mark here, so let me just try and move forward. The second issue is, is on counterterrorism, and what I'd like to stress here, uh, just to be brief, is that we really need to address not just targeting the foreign jihadist leaders in the country, but addressing the context within, w that within which they operate. On a very tactical level, the foreign jihadists cannot exist in a place like Mogadishu without some clan supporting them, without some clan's militia supporting them and finding ways to bargain with that protection group, to convince the elders and the big businessmen of that group that their interests lie much more in joining with the TFG and building a common Somali future and showing them again very tactically how their own parochial interests will benefit from that participation and how they will lose from continuing to protect the Islamists. That's a level of very tactical diplomacy that needs to take place. And I'll just conclude very quickly with um, the need for strategic communication. Um, this is a word that's being bandied around um, in Washington these days quite a lot, but it doesn't really seem to translate down to the, the field level. If we want to talk about strategic communication, where is the outreach that U.S. diplomats have to engage with and be seen engaging with moderate and traditional Islamic leaders in Mogadishu in a positive way? 
uh, we need to dispel this myth that's being propagated in Mogadishu that the war on terrorism is really a war on Islam. Um, and certainly the case can be made in a better way and in a public way to um, the wider Somali public regarding who it is in terms of terrorist actors that the U.S., the international community, and their Somali partners are after. It's not about targeting sheikhs in general. It's not about targeting traditional Somali Islam. It's about some very bad individuals, but focusing on the individuals. I'll leave it there. Good. Thank you, Andre. Uh, we'll open it up now for questions. Uh, we'll take a couple questions and cluster them and give our speakers an opportunity uh, to react to them. We have a little over 20 minutes. I'd ask that people please be brief and identify themselves. There are microphones that will be uh, passed around. Who would like to open up with a, a question? <coughs> seeing no hands, let me uh, pick up on uh, Andre's last question. I'm seeing some hands now, but there was no n immediate response. Could you talk just a little bit more about the relationship between, I mean, the reason that Somalia is on the U.S. foreign policy agenda primarily uh, is this uh, issue of uh, al-Qaeda in, in, in Somalia, and you discussed at the end of your remarks uh, that they couldn't exist without clan support. How does the uh, those how does the internal domestic the, the domestic political <coughs> issues interact with this issue of uh, uh, of an ex external sort of terrorist presence there? I mean, are are <coughs> the support groups for Al Qaeda? How do they how do they line up relative to the political cleavages um, uh, that you also both speakers also addressed? I'm sure that Matt will want to reply to this as well. Um, I, I think there are, there are different levels here. I mean, most immediately, if you have uh, some of the Al Qaeda operatives, and we're talking about individuals here who were involved in the 1998 embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, we're talking about people who were involved in the 2002 attacks and people who have lent support to the attacks on foreign aid workers and Somalis um, over the past couple of years. The immediate protection cell is individuals with a history of association with Islamic extremism, a history of involvement in groups such as Ali Tihad. Um, their position, um, not a position that they necessarily express directly themselves, but a position that is expressed by maybe sometimes some nonviolent <coughs> fundamentalist groups associated with Islamic courts or others, is one of direct opposition to, um, to the transitional federal government and direct <coughs> opposition uh, to the warlords who are involved in it. Um, those individuals, though that Somali protection group, if you will, they themselves, of course, come from, from clans and subclans. And to the extent that the clans and subclans that they come from are not comfortable with their position in the transitional federal government, then maybe those clans and subclans see the, the militants as a potential ally, a potential tool if it ever comes to a fight. Matt, do we? Yeah, I, would, I would just add, in terms of specifics, what we've seen in, in particularly Mogadishu, which is where the sort of current problem is, is primarily based, not exclusively. Um, the the uh, extremist individuals tend to associate themselves who have been very effectively manipulating, exploiting clan solidarity and institutional cover. So uh, particularly in some of, some of the Islamic courts, you see some of the militia leaders who have been involved in extremist activities um, surrounding themselves with a militia and then trying to use the cover of the court system as a whole to, um, to legitimize their activities. The court system is in fact a, a heterogeneous system. Uh, but each court, additionally, tends to be associated with a given clan. And so uh, extremists within a given court militia can count on both or can exploit both the cover of the courts as an institution and then, of course, their clan affiliation to say, if someone comes after me, they're either after the courts or they're after my clan and the militia that tend to be associated with a specific court. And so... Um, I think quite, um, there, there is also, of course, as Andre said, there's been a lack of clarity on being able to focus on a handful of individuals um, and their, their foreign uh, connections. And so uh, there is a general sense also in the Somali public uh, that uh, these efforts are either unfounded, uh, they're not uh, particularly focused at a given group, 
um, and that uh, they may be wrong-headed, that maybe it's just an aversion to the court system, which has provided a level of peace and security, or to, to other religious groups, more mainstream religious groups in the country. It doesn't help that some of the counterterrorism partners over the years and some of the governments involved have conflated uh, a number of different concepts. They talk about al-Qaeda, they talk about al-Itihad, al-Islah, tabliq, Wahhabism, whatever, uh, depending on whoever's speaking, conflating them all and saying these are all the bad guys. Of course, that is not the case. Uh, it needs to be a much more targeted message. Um, and uh, I think those extremists have benefited from these ambiguities and from the... Uh, uh, from their own uh, individual and institutional affiliations. Okay, let's take a couple questions from the floor. Um, gentleman on the side there, there's a microphone coming to you. <coughs> Speakers could identify themselves, and then this gentleman here. My name is Ibrahim, Ibrahim Hamad. I have no idea. It's okay, on. My name is Ibrahim, Ibrahim Hamad. I'm from Somalia. I would like to uh, ask Andre a question. You mentioned that Djibouti process. Uh, Primarily, the Djiboutian government invited the businessmen who profited the war. I would like you to go back and compare Djibouti with Mbagati. Djibouti government made an effort to go back to Somalia, every region, and try to recruit a grassroots basis, uh, the elderly, the women, uh, the educated, and therefore that process was much more uh, fair than the one managed by Kenya and, and Ethiopia, two countries that have a clear <coughs> agenda about Somalia. That's one thing I'd like to thank comment. You, thank you very much. My second comment is, if you don't mind, you've also mentioned about the destabilization for the Muslim element in Mogadishu. I agree with you. They do destabilize the country. But did your academic investigation find out also the Ethiopian element that came to Mogadishu who assassinates anyone who they deem threat? In post-September 11, any Muslim is considered to be a terrorist. Okay. Thank you for your question. Sir, I think it should be on. So, My name is Eric Robinson uh, with Somali Family Care Network. A question for you. Do you have a sense that after uh, the parliament, well, as they split from Nairobi, pushed out of Nairobi, um, when approximately 100 went to Mogadishu. Do you have a sense that some of those 100 really went back with the intent, the honest intent of trying to clear the ground, to try and lay the groundwork for the rest of the parliament to come in and uh, got caught up in another direction uh, based on the politics and the pressure on the speaker of the parliament? Uh, or was it that there was a split by the 100 and they all went and nobody was planning on trying to you know, push good offices uh, with those on the ground in Mogadishu. Okay, thank you. Um, Andre and Matt, why don't you I'll apply to your respective? Let you have <coughs> parliament. Um, it, by no means did I mean to say that um, the Djibouti process was entirely dominated by businessmen. Absolutely. One of the, the major successes of, um, of the Arta Conference was the involvement of civil society. And I, I think that that's reflected in, in one, of the most important, um, one of the most important achievements of, of Arta, which lives on today, which is the 4.5 formula. I know it's a highly contested formula, um, and some people don't think it's good. But um, at the same time, because it had that civil society base and everyone was there, you could arrive at these very, very large-scale conclusions. Um, but I, I don't think that the notion that civil society was there and that businessmen um, who had been profiteers were also playing an important role, those two things can go together in the same peace process, and I, I do think they did. Vis-a-vis um, Mbagathi, -vis it was a struggle, I can assure you, to try and get more civil society representation there. Um, the original invitations, I think, were supposed to be for around 300 individuals. Um, and one-third of the representatives were originally intended to be from civil society. In the end, over a thousand people came and were there in Eldoret and then in Bagathi for, for well over a year. So of that thousand, certainly not all of them were faction leaders, but the, the invitation process had its own, had its own problems. 
Um, and I don't think anyone can doubt the fact that, that Ethiopia and others have also been involved in activities in Mogadishu and other parts of the country. I actually strongly agree with what Matt is saying, which is that instead of talking about, um, about Muslim leaders, of which there are so many um, in Somalia, what we really are talking about in terms of security interests is a very, very small, specific number of individuals who have rejected <coughs> mainstream teachings in Islam and are pursuing a very, uh, a very distinct agenda of their own. And we really need the debate, the discussion, and the politics of the situation to focus on those individuals, not on the, um, not on the, the peace that others are preaching. I would just add to that last comment that um, we did, uh, a crisis group did in a, in a paper middle of last year try to document, or at least begin to document, uh, the activities of, of a number of different intelligence services, and we did in fact describe some of the Ethiopian uh, involvement in Mogadishu, by no means comprehensive, but uh, yes, it, it is an issue, and certainly for the residents of Mogadishu, some other places. Um, uh, Someone is just leaning against the live switch. The intelligence services are very active. Uh, we, won't, we, won't, we won't return to that subject. Um, on the question of the parliament, um, I think um, I don't think it's a matter of one group getting caught up with one thing or the other. Uh, both camps were equally convinced of the rightness of their cause. Uh, on the Johar side, there were, I think, um, somewhat legitimate concerns that there were spoilers. There, there, as there, there are across Somalia people whose whose vested interest is either in preventing a state emerging or making sure that they have secured their interests uh, as that state comes forward. And there were those who felt that some of the some of the actors on the Mogadishu side uh, were spoilers, were going to spoil the transition and that if they were given the opportunity within the institutions, they were just going to block decision-making. Um, and in fact, in Mogadishu itself, in an atmosphere of insecurity, uh, if necessary, uh, assassinate and, and disrupt the activities of the government. On the other side, there was a feeling that the decisions to move the government to Johar, call for foreign troops and lift the arms embargo, were being done unilaterally, that this was a hijack of the transition. And so on both sides, you had a mix of opportunists and those who genuinely felt that they were defending different things. One, the opportunity for the executive to lead in a way that previous transitional governments had not been led, firmly, decisively, clearly. And on the other side, to defend the prerogatives of parliament and also of those elements of the charter they felt had been violated. Um, the key, as, as I see it, um, was that while both claimed to have majority, majority of support, neither was actually able to demonstrate that by convening a clear majority of parliamentarians on the ground. And so there was this bickering backwards and forwards about, you know, we represent the government, we represent the government, when in fact um, it was clear that both were, um, well, neither could get more than a plurality, in fact. We had, a, you know, a hundred and something on either side, and then we had another floating number of parliamentarians some of whom uh, seem to have disappeared back to the diaspora and hopefully will, will reconvene in, in Baidoa. So the, uh, the, issue, the issue has really become whatever those grievances were and whoever was right, um, since neither has the, the political upper hand, the key is to come together and negotiate those differences. Uh, it's a little alarming that one of the first debates opened in Baidoa while Parliament is briefly recessed is once again the arms embargo. And we've got one side raising it, the other side saying if you do that, we're going to end up in stalemate again. Um, my sense is that if, if the parliamentary session is to be a success, then these political issues need to be set aside while the parliament organizes itself with its committees, agrees on an agenda to go forward, and once it is functioning as an institution, it may be able to address these issues without falling apart and paralyzing the process. But if we start with the most divisive issues on the agenda, then there's a real risk that the Baidoa session will go nowhere. Down to our last few minutes, let's take two more questions. Uh, Jonathan Tucker and the woman here. Jonathan Tucker, Modern <coughs> Institute of International Studies. How do you explain the relative peace and security in northern Somalia, the, the two statelets in the north as opposed to the south? Okay, and final question, woman here.
My name is Khadija Ali. I'm also from Somalia. I just want to make one quick comment about what uh, Matt said and ask one question, uh, Mr. Seg. And the thing that have, I think, united uh, Mohammed Air and Musa probably is money. Money can do wonders, so it's just a comment. Mm. We were all shocked and surprised that they could uh, come together and work. Uh, my question is, now what, ha what is happening in Mogadishu, uh, the, the recent development, the fighting that's going on, what do you think that the impact that it could have? Because those Islamic courts provide some sort of security to the people. And uh, the track record of the warlords are not very good. And it seems that they are actually the front line in this uh, theme of uh, war on terror. How do you think that could impact uh, this relationship between Somalia and the United States and also this ideology that's building? Is it empowering the fundamentalists or actually fighting against them? First, the north. Okay, um, on, on the Mogadishu situation, um, I, I think we have to realize that we're really in the middle of this fight right now. Um, it hasn't been settled. There have been overtures from, from the clans to try and reach an agreement, but uh, what I was seeing in the news this morning was that the military buildups were continuing. Um, it's going to take some time to tell what's happening. There have been reports that some of the courts which are less associated with militancy and fundamentalism might be splitting away um, from some of the hardline ones. There are other reports that generally the fight has forced most of the Islamic court militia to coalesce behind an agenda uh, led by a, a small group of radicals in, in their leadership. Um, what's going to be decisive in determining the, the longer term outcome of this is, is how the clans respond. As, as Matt mentioned, each of the courts has its clan basis. And um, if, if the Habergadir Ayer or the Murasadeh courts or, or others, if their elders are able to come together and, and reach some agreements about being able to live together peacefully, being able to keep the courts for the very, very positive purposes that they serve with regard to um, peace, security, and some degree of justice for, for local um, Somalis in, in Mogadishu, but at the same time to excise the, the threat presented by a very small number uh, of militants in their midst, that would be the most positive outcome because it would prevent future violence. Um, yes, money always has influence on, on uh, the, the thinking of the faction leaders, but I think it's very interesting that uh, Musa Sudi has come out with statements saying that he is strongly opposed to this small group of, uh, of militants in the midst, and he sees them as a threat to the, to the future. Um, that is a, a principled stand, I would think, in addition to whatever very practical parochial interests uh, are there. I, I, I would just add to that particular point. I don't think it's, it's particularly helpful that this uh, fighting has expressed itself in terms of terrorism, counterterrorism, and courts and, and religion. Um, whatever the reasons may be, and that may be part of it, um, the, this, is, this is very much likely to create exactly the opportunity for those groups that are using uh, religion as a banner <laughs> for very different purposes to uh, entrench themselves even more deeply. Um, within clan, factional, and polit political coalitions. It's, um, it's, it's counterproductive. Um, the, on the other hand, it's happening. Um, and I think the, the concern um, should be that um, there, is likely, there is likely to be more of this coming. I mean, both sides are digging in. Both sides are, are apparently re-equipping and re-arming. Um, and it is in no one's, first of all, it's in no one's interest to have this conflict. Secondly, it's not in the interest of those groups that have um, jihadi uh, or extremist groups living in their neighborhoods and exploiting their hospitality uh, to keep them there either. But ultimately, the cleaning house is going to have to be done um, by people in their own neighborhoods or within their own clans or their own groups. It can't be done by factional coalitions fighting their way in and... Uh, and threatening, so I think uh, it's it's not <coughs> been a positive development. 
<clears throat> in terms of the north and the south, there are no simple answers. That is a, that is a huge question. Um, I think there are a number, a number of reasons. Most of them are, are historical. Um, one of them is that um, <coughs> the, the war in the north, uh, in some form or another, continued much longer uh, than the war in the south. And what uh, that created a number of opportunities. One, it created opportunities for, for the movement to be more structured, in that case the SNM, because it fought for a number of years, but also for its relations with other groups in the north to develop during the war. While groups were fighting, they were also talking and making peace with one another. So once the war was over, the, the relationships were already established through which people could come together and say, we stop. Um, and then we saw a, a process of community-based conferences that gave rise to the institutions that have largely provided stability there. We saw the same kind of process, uh, with obvious variations, begin in Puntland, starting somewhat later, there was what uh, some called the permanent transition. There was a period where you had a faction in charge for many years, but then all, all of a sudden engaging a kind of community-based process that gave rise to institutions uh, in 1998. In the South, a number of things have prevented that from happening. One was the multitude of, of rebel movements that moved into the South in the last stages of the Civil War that didn't have relations with each other, weren't able to agree on a government immediately. Second, that the transitional institutions and the kind of or <coughs> traditional institutions and community-based processes uh, were obstructed partly by heterogeneity. Uh, you have many different uh, uh, groups in the South, including linguistic groups, uh, but also because the experience of colonialism had done much more damage to traditional structures there than it had in the North. You could go on. This is a debate that I hear the Fadi Kudir, the uh, the uh, armchair warriors in, in Somalia have on a daily basis for hours. But I think basically you look at a historical process. Uh, I don't believe that, that uh, one group was necessarily uh, more mature and better prepared, but I think their historical experiences left them in very different situations when the, states co when the state collapsed. Well, thank you very much, Matt. On behalf of the Africa Program and the Leadership Project of the Woodrow Wilson Center, I'd like to thank you all for attending today. Please join me in thanking our speakers for their excellent presentation.
Does that sound like your old man or what? Yeah, it does. It's kind of like, you're going to be doing it nicely. Hello. 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 That's one thing, that, like every event, you have to like, like, this person forgot their stuff. You gotta pick it up. Oh, hey, perfect. Yes. <laughs> the other stuff was gone. We have one Uganda publication, it's downstairs. Do you really need it? That's okay. <laughs> I did that play when I was in college. Oh, cool. So you'll know all the lines. Well, well, let me see. I did that play in 1976. <laughs> <laughs> Shut right. Up. So you might not know all the lines. Yeah. Well, I remember two. I remember two. There's a neat part where the character Myron, the one I play, he, he walk, he's, he's, he's a henpecked husband. Mm -hmm. And he walks all the way through the house. And this one thing, he just comes out of the kitchen and walks all the way through the house. Walks into the living room and goes, why did they come in here? And turns around and walks away. It's the hardest minute and a half I ever had on stage. I'm telling well, you. you're going to get to relive it. Have fun. Yeah. Thank you for your help today. You're welcome. Yeah. 